Craig Nelson, in his book, V is for Victory, reports on the number of casualties from World War II. He writes, according to the U.S. Department of Defense, the military casualties were 1,078,000. 405,000 were killed, 673,115 were wounded. Then according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there were over 8.9 million American war industry worker casualties. 75,000 died and 8.8 million were wounded between 1942 and 1945. Author Craig Nelson further says, across history, the arsenal of democracy, in quotes, has come to mean this miracle of manufacturing. But when President Roosevelt often used the term, he meant, however, the miracle of the American people. Craig Nelson, in your book, V is for Victory, one of the people you talk about early and often is William Knudsen. Who was he? So Bill Knudsen is one of the great all-American stories of World War II, uh, a, a secret hero who deserves much more recognition than he gets. He, he arrives uh, uh, as a young man with $30 in his pocket from having engineered Copenhagen's first bicycle built for two. Uh, he arrives from Denmark. His first job is working with dock workers on the Bronx, where he becomes a championship boxer. Uh, uh, and this unlikely series of events leads him to a horseless carriage job uh, a steam-powered horseless carriage job where he goes to night school and sets up a partnership with one of the other men at the company and they design a new alloy they create a new kind of metal which is used by ransom olds for oldsmobile brakes and by henry ford for many things and henry ford becomes so taken with this little company that he buys the whole thing and has it shipped to michigan and dudson begins this incredible rise through the fields of ford he he's one of the people who helps design the for famous Ford assembly line by bringing in ideas from the meat packing industry of bringing the cars overhead on, on, a, on an overhead chain, moving chain from worker to worker. And he also sets up a system whereby he gets information back from the dealers and the repair shops to come up with new ways of selling more Fords. He engineers an enormous change in Ford Motor, making it an international company, but he and Henry then lock heads and he goes off to General Motors, where he takes over Chevy, repairs it, makes it a money making operation for the first time in decades and rises to become president. And in 1940, after the fall of France, when Franklin Roosevelt is looking for what to do next in, in getting the United States ready to fight Hitler, he asks Bernard Baruch, who was a Wall Street sage at the time, who are the three top industrial men in the United States? And Baruch says, number one would be Bill Knudsen, and number two would be Bill Knudsen, and number three would be Bull Knudsen. So Roosevelt calls Knudsen, asks him to come to Washington, and this really launches uh, in a, the, the full force of what we'd call the arsenal of democracy. What's he do, though? He takes over and uh, trying to integrate uh, American business with American military and Washington uh, bureaucracy. And and he, he is very successful in many ways, uh, most, most beautifully in the issue of tanks. So during the 40s, the uh, British purchasing agent named Purvis shows up and, and they're trying to help Britain. And he says, well, we need tanks. In fact, we need a thousand a month. And in the uh, year, in the Years from 1919 to 1935, America had produced 33 tanks. So a thousand a month was a big problem. So what Knudsen did was he eventually called KT Keller, the head of Chrysler, and he said, KT, United States needs you to make tanks. And Keller says, oh, I'd love to. What is a tank? This is, this is the level of American industrial <laughs> defense at the time. And, and Keller goes up to um, the armory where the armory makes its tanks and sees how it's done. And he's flabbergasted to see that none of Detroit's methods of product, mass production, which includes having uh, parts that are accurate to uh, one hundredth of an inch in, in uh, being identically the same. Uh, none of them have appeared. That basically, they're sort of making a tank almost by hand, uh, which is why they're making 13 a year. So he 
gets Chrysler gets gets a tank and makes a blueprint out of it, hundreds, uh, tens of uh, hundreds of pounds of pages of blueprints to make a tank. They make a dummy one out of wood to make sure it all works. And then they start producing tank after tank after tank. And they end up making 88,000 tanks, more tanks from this one factory than the whole of the Nazi production for the whole of the war. And that's sort of one of the stories of, of this book. Who else right away comes to mind that made a big difference in the production of World War II and that they came from industry? Well, the great, uh, the follow-up, his uh, Knudsen's colleague and his replacement after he got canned by Roosevelt was, was a guy named Donald Nelson, who comes from Sears. And he liked to joke to journalists that he oversaw a much bigger publication than anything they did, the Sears catalog. And, and what Nelson was brilliant at was he coordinated all of Sears. Now, Sears was the Amazon of its time. It was the great revolution in retailing uh, and direct-to-consumer sales. It, it bypassed going through retail stores. We know Sears as stores, but at this point, it was an entirely a catalog operation. And what Nelson did was he knew how to get a certain kind of fabric and where to get it milled and where to get it cut and whether it would be good for making tents or children's pajamas or, or all these different kinds of things. And he literally had a map of American industrial production sort of in the back of his mind. He even had situations where people would try and uh, game the Sears process by by coming up with ways to monopolize uh, production, and he would figure out how to undo them. And, and the great fight that Nelson would have with the military was was over buttons. Uh, it turns out that both Nelson and Knudsen learned a profound lesson that you we all want our military offers, officers to be fighting men, but we don't want any of them to be fighting us. And so in their dealings with the military, they were constantly having these squabbles, such as uh, when when Nelson took over, they came up with the idea that the military could prioritize what it needed out of all of these essential elements, aluminum, petroleum, uh, carbon steel, stainless steel, uh, uh, ingots, uh, copper, all zinc, all these kinds of things the army could prioritize, the military could prioritize. Only what happened was within about 18 months, the military prioritized everything. It said it needed everything ahead of the consumer economy, and that didn't work. So they had to come up with a new system. You said that uh, FDR fired Knudsen. Why? So um, the great problem in people understanding about all this is that when you switch from making cars to making bombers, uh, there's a big problem in that stage of production where you have to go through redoing your entire factory and creating all new machine tools. And machine tools are the machines that make other machines. Just like nowadays we have robots that make other robots. Then they had machines that made other machines. And machine tools came in sizes. They could be as small as a jewelry box or as big as a house. And they were the things that warped and cut and bent plastic and metal at wood to turn into parts for making things. Well, if you were if you were switching from cars to bombers, you would have to bring in an entirely different set of machine tools and line them all up. And our machine tool business in America was pathetic at that time. Uh, some of the machine tool companies dated to the revolution, the, the 1776 revolution, and they were still basically making machine tools in that way. So we need to have this sort of revolution in machine tools in order to do mass production. And, and the general public, including Roosevelt and the head of war, Stimson, couldn't understand what was taking so long. And they thought it was because Knudsen wasn't being tough enough with his fellow Detroit executives, which was true. As you know, we keep hearing it's we're having a difficult time building very many ships for the United States Navy today. I say that because I read this statistics and you have lots of statistics in the book. This progress meant that while in 1941, the United States built 1,906 ships, but in 1944, it built 40,265 ships. How is that possible? Well, 
the entire story of the Navy in World War II can pretty much be told in the stories of two figures. The first was a man named Henry Kaiser, who came out of the gravel business, uh, became a general contractor, uh, then created a consortium called the Six Companies, which was a, 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 an association of various contractors out west and construction men out west. And their first contract was to build the Hoover Dam. And they did it under budget and early, uh, uh, on time and under budget. And they ended up getting one government contract after the next. And what Kaiser did especially was create shipyards. He created shipyards all over the West Coast, primarily out of Oakland and out of Washington. And he would create what we know as Liberty ships, the Model Ts of the ocean. And he would produce them in fantastic amounts, such that one of my favorite World War II stories is that in the middle of World War II, uh, a, a history teacher is calling on her class to name who was the face that launched a thousand ships, meaning she thought Helen of Troy, and instead the class said Henry Kaiser. So this is how he had his own MGM biopic. He, this is how famous he was. And he also came up with the idea of baby flat tops. There was a terrible problem in the Battle of the Atlantic with Nazi subs taking down the supplies we were sending to England and to the USSR, as well as American oil tankers. He came up with the idea of very small aircraft carriers that would patrol alongside these a uh, convoy of, of merchant ships and te and defend them from Nazi subs. His, his colleague uh, uh, was an incredible character named Andrew Jackson Higgins. And Higgins uh, grew up in New Orleans and he engineered a very shallow draft flat bottom boat, uh, which were called the Wonder Boats. And they were used by the Department, the Treasury Department to stop smugglers. They were also, I assume, used by smugglers, but he sold quite a bit of them. And he developed a very big uh, audience with the US Marines, where they were starting to buy his flat bottom boats all the time in order to launch attacks on beaches. Because, uh, and so all the pictures we have of, of men attacking the beach in World War II, they're coming off of Higgins' low draft boats. LC boats. And he had a terrible time getting going with the Navy, but finally they got going. And, and Higgins was able to produce so much landing craft that Eisenhower said he was the reason we won the war and the reason why the National History Museum of World War II is in New Orleans. All right. Other names. Admiral King, Admiral, Admiral Ernest King. <clears throat> what was so he Ernest about and, and who did he fight with during World War II? <laughs> Ernie King fought, fought with everybody. So what happens is in the wake of Pearl Harbor, they uh, they get rid of uh, Betty Stark, who was the chief of naval operations, and promote King. And King was incredibly belligerent, but he sort of needed to be because everyone in the military, especially with the British involved, were doing a Hitler first strategy. And the Pacific theater was really a Navy theater. So he was really getting short shifted and he needed to fight with everybody. Uh, uh, but King was a fantastic character. I mean, one of the things that's so interesting in World War II history is the people who did everything were just these outrageous, wild, idiosyncratic people. So King, for example, vanished every day from four to seven. And we don't know to this day what he was doing when he was away, but he was he was away from the war for three hours a day every day. Uh, he he also said uh, he also had great quotes like, um, "I don't know what this logistics thing is that Marshall is always talking about, but I want some of it." Uh, and, and he was he was uh, really really outrageous, but but a great deal of the Navy's success in World War II. And it's rising from the shame of Pearl Harbor and becoming the service we know today is due to Ernie King. You mentioned Marshall. How important was George Marshall during this whole war period and after? Well, one of the things I really enjoyed in doing this book was we all know Marshall as a, today as a great man. But at the start of this story, he's not there yet. At the start of the story, he's arguing with with um, uh, uh, Roosevelt over sending supplies to uh, Russia and to uh, the UK and to France before it falls, because everyone in, in, in the military, the military had been starved 
for decades from the end of World War One, and they were so used to being in this position that any time they saw a plane going to another country, they thought that should have been my plane. They didn't understand that as long as we were supplying these other countries, they were to, before Pearl Harbor, they were doing the fighting for us, that we didn't need to send troops and, and, and servicemen into battle while this was going on. But they couldn't really grasp that. So they were constantly squabbling over Lend-Lease and the various other support programs that were going on. And, and there was a very big trend in the Army and the Navy following in the steps of, of Charles Lindbergh to be isolationists to claim that we didn't need to do anything overseas. We could just wait until the Nazis arrived in the Western Hemisphere, and then we would defend the Western Hemisphere. Well, by the time they actually thought the Nazis might show up, they didn't have enough of an army to defend the Western Hemisphere. So that sort of converted uh, uh, Marshall into more getting along better with Roosevelt and being a unified front. Who was responsible for building the B-24, the B-25, the B-29? What's the story behind that? So the B-29 is an incredible story, and I wish I had spent more time on it. The, the creation of the B-29 was more expensive by a billion dollars than the creation of the atomic bomb. And it was an incredible state-of-the-art plane. You can see one today in Washington, D.C., the Enola Gay. Uh, but, but, but the incredible story about the other bombers really centers around Edsel Ford. And today, Edsel Ford is remembered for being the namesake of an ugly car. And it's really a shame because Edsel Ford was desperate to get out from under the shadow of his father, who was an anti-Semite and so uh, belligerent and hostile to Roosevelt that he refused to take part in the arts of democracy until someone threatened him. Whereas Edsel always wanted to do this. And Edsel's great love was aviation. And he wanted to make planes. So he ended up converting a uh, little uh, uh, camp that Henry had as a, as a charity into one of the greatest feats of American engineering in the world. It's called Willow Run. And it produced one B-24 bomber an hour. And this massive production was the whole reason we were able to cross the Pacific to take back the Pacific from Japan, and to send out the bombs that would soften up Germany and France for the Normandy invasion. And really, he was a great hero of the war, and it's a shame he died young of stomach cancer and and uh, being poisoned by Henry's unpasteurized milk. So it's a real shame we don't more, know more about Edsel Ford. Can one go and see Willow Run today? And if they can, what's left of it? Well, now it's uh, uh, it's still in operation. I believe right now it's a test track. It was it's been sold and resold to various people. But I think at this moment, the last time I checked, which I think was four or five years ago in the research stage, it was a test track. So it was still being used for something. Why was Henry Ford such an anti-Semite? What was the what was the reason he he gave for that? It's really mysterious because um, Ford started off being really the Steve Jobs of the automotive industry. He was this incredible state of the art person who took all these different ideas people were having and turned them into a brand new way of manufacturing. He created a machine that was, the factory that he created was really a machine in and of itself. And he took ideas for um, uh, 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 uniform sizing of material so that if you had a bolt, the same size bolt was the same size bolt for everything uh, from Singer sewing machine. He took the way of laying out a factory from the um, Sears Roebuck delivery operation. He, he uh, Knudsen brought in the idea of using overhead chains carrying uh, the chassis from uh, the, the uh, meat plant, meat packing industry. And he took all these different ideas and turned them into the state of the art mass production that was the industrial miracle of Detroit at the time. Uh, and he was the he and Edsel were the two richest men in the world. At one point, they had 1.2 billion, which would be 20 billion dollars to 40 billion dollars today, and 
joint assets when when uh, uh, when one had, one had a birthday, the singer was Frank Sinatra, this kind of thing. Uh, but he was really incredible and forward thinking. And then all of a sudden it changed. All of a sudden he started putting out this terrible anti-Semitic uh, magazine that the four dealers had to sell to all the customers. And, and, and he really went insane. And he really had a hostility towards Roosevelt in a, in a sort of deranged way because Ford at that time was a global company. It was making things in Germany for the Germans and in England for the English, but refusing to make things in America for the Americans. And Edsel had to finally say, you know, Dad, I heard Eleanor Roosevelt on the radio, and she said if there's a national emergency, the president could take over Ford. And that's what finally changed his tune. And then what did he do for the war? He allowed Edsel to create Willow Run. Uh, he also created a lot of engines for airplanes. There, there, both he and GM, Alfred Sloan, the head of GM, was also anti-Roosevelt. But finally, they realized they needed to do this where they could make a lot of money and be patriotic at the same time. The contracts were that the government would cover all of your costs and then pay you an 8% guaranteed um, profit on all of your sales. So it, unless you were doing really, really well, it was a great deal, but uh, the car industry had to be talked into this because it meant not producing any domestic, almost no domestic automobiles were produced during the war years. How many American companies continued to make industrial products inside Germany during the war? All of them. And, and got a profit out of it? Yes. And how much did we? GM's use? company was called Opel, right? How, GM's how, company was called Opel. Go how, ahead. How, no, I, I was going to ask is how much of that did Americans know at the time? Almost nothing because they weren't really knowledgeable about what was going on overseas. I mean, the Americans. Well, there was two kinds of issues going on. One was that the Americans weren't that knowledgeable about things that were happening overseas. So they didn't really understand how crazy Hitler was until very late into the war. They they only they were mad at the Japanese because they had attacked Pearl Harbor. And then they knew Hitler had declared war on us a couple of days after that. But they were they didn't really understand how deranged things were overseas. They would see newsreels of of uh, Nazis attacking the Dutch. So they would feel bad for the Dutch, but they didn't really see it as an existential threat until very late in the war. And they also were getting pretty informed about the Holocaust because it was being reported on by Edward R. Murrow and everybody listened to Edward R. Murrow on the radio. He was a huge CBS radio network star, but they couldn't comprehend it because it was too, it was so gruesome, it was impossible to believe. And even uh, a Jewish man, Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, was introduced to a Holocaust survivor at, by the Polish government in exile. And the guy told him about the escaping from a Nazi concentration camp and what was going on there. And Frankfurter turned to the Poles and said, I don't believe him. And they said, you can't say this man is lying. He said, I don't think he's lying. I just don't believe him. It was so overwhelming, the Holocaust, that people couldn't understand it. So they couldn't really believe it until the evidence came out after the war. How much did FDR know about the manufacturing of U.S. companies inside Germany during the war? And did he try to do anything about it? He knew pretty much all of it, but could not could not do anything about it. What he could do about it was get these companies to support the arsenal of democracy here. They um, uh, there really isn't, you know, uh, today uh, a president couldn't force Apple to move all its manufacturing out of China. And the same thing was true then. Who invented the term arsenal of democracy? So it has many fathers. Uh, but I think the great story about that is that when Roosevelt used the term, he didn't mean American manufacturing. He meant the American people. And why did, why did others didn't mean that, though? I mean, who else defined it as being you know, the building of manufacturing? Well, it started off with the idea of 
uh, that this was America's, uh, it started off actually around World War I. The first notation of Arsenal Joachery is around World War I, when uh, someone is writing that the genius of America is manufacturing and that should be our arsenal of democracy. Then both Bill Knudsen and um, Bob Sherwood, who was a White House speechwriter, remember mentioning it to Roosevelt, who then used it in a famous uh, uh, fireside chat to announce to America that this is what we needed to do. And this would have been, this was in 1940, over a year before Pearl Harbor. What I'm about to ask you is somewhat meaningless, but I'm gonna ask you it anyway. <clears throat> Depending on where you go, there were 27 fireside chats, 30 fireside chats, or 31 fireside chats. Do you happen to have the right answer? Oh, I don't off the top of my head. I can say that it's it, 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 many people get confused between what was a, recorded press conference, what was specifically a fireside chat, what was the president responding to a public issue on the radio. I mean, Roosevelt was the biggest radio star. So it's sort of like divvying up Taylor Swift concerts. Uh, <laughs> it's almost a, a pointless issue. You just, you just find out when he said something and give the date and, and saying whether it was this or that or this or that. You know, I mean, one of the greatest moments in, in Lend-Lease is the garden hose where, where Roosevelt says, you know, about helping the British, suppose your neighbor's house catches on fire and you have a fine piece of garden hose. And everyone assumes this was at a special speech that he prepared, it was a, no, it was a broadcast um, uh, uh, press conference. He just casually tossed off this garden hose that everyone who was alive then remembers <laughs> and, and and just drops this at a, at a, a broadcast press conference. When did Len Lee start and what was it? Well, I will have to look up Len Lee's for you. So would you like to look it up or do you want me to look up? I mean, the date it started. Well, the date isn't as important as what it was and basically right. why did we get into it and how right. much, how, when, when in your opinion, throw this into the mix, did FDR know we were going to go to war? Right. So one of the great things in doing this book was to find out how advanced Franklin Roosevelt was in knowing what was going on. Because uh, in 1938, after the appeasement offered by Britain and France to Europe, to uh, Hitler, giving up pieces of Czechoslovakia, Roosevelt reacted by setting up an entire new federal program based on things he was doing in the New Deal to dramatically uh, enhance American warplane production. And because the military was still isolationist, they didn't want to do it. So he put it in the hands of Morgenthau, his treasury secretary. And this program so dramatically boosted warplane production and then ended up supplying warplanes to, at that time, uh, France and England, as well as boosting American defenses, as well as making money and helping to fight the unemployment of the Great Depression. And this multi-pronged policy uh, he would use again and again. And this is what the arsenal of democracy was. It both fought Hitler, it helped our allies, and it helped end the unemployment of the Depression. And so he had to sell this idea to people who were very isolationist, both uh, ordinary American citizens and people on Capitol Hill. And he set up one situation after the next to sort of ease people into this. The first was to get around neutrality acts by offering something called cash and carry, where people could show up, buy American goods, and take them away. So America wasn't actually participating in any kind of war making activity. The second was he traded old destroyers from World War I for Caribbean bases with England. And this was called destroyers for bases. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, and that was the little tiny thing. And then uh, he had this incredible moment where uh, England was really on its last legs and they were about to completely fall apart. And Churchill sent him this letter begging and begging and begging for help. And he came up with the idea of Lend-Lease, which he announced to the American public on a um, uh, televised press conference saying, suppose you have your neighbor's house is on fire and you have some garden hose. What you want is to lend the hose to the neighbor. And if you get it back, that's just fine. And if you don't, and the neighbor replaces it, that's just fine too. And that's what we're going to do. Well, 
elated over this idea was the fact that we probably weren't going to get our war blades back in good shape. But but everyone thought, well, if Garden Hose is going to save England, let's do it. So <laughs> it was an entire program of producing uh, material for France and England and then USSR and shipping it to them. And so it's dramatically boosting American production. It's fixing the Great Depression. People are making money and we're helping defend Hitler against Hitler without sending any American servicemen overseas. And this would uh, an eight this ended up being 18 months ahead of Pearl Harbor. I want to divert for a couple of minutes uh, and, and talk about you. Uh, where are you today? Physically? Oh, I live in Greenwich Village. Down in New York City. Uh huh. When did you first start writing for a living? Oh, I was a pu book publishing executive at Random House, Harper and Hyperion for 20 years. And then I switched to writing full time. And the first book was The First Heroes, which was the story of the Doolittle Raid. And that came out in 2002. So I'm on my I'm on uh, 21 years of writing full time. When you were publishing, who were co some of the authors you came in contact with that we would know? Uh, I did uh, books with famous people. So they would be Andy Warhol and Lily Tomlin and Philip Glass and uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino and uh, and people like that. What's your biggest memory of Andy Warhol? So Andy Warhol and I and some people from uh, his company from the factory were went out uh, for drinks at a place that was opening a new nightclub. So they were handing out free drinks and we just went to see it. And it was really boring and we didn't like it at all. And, and everyone was tired. So we're sitting there practically falling asleep and the chair rattles and it sting, the singer sting. So this perks us up a little bit and we're feeling good. And the other chair rattles and it's Bob Dylan. And so there we are with Sting and Bob Dylan and Andy Warhol leans over to me and whispers in my ear, can you believe who we're sitting with? <laughs> so what did you learn about authors before you began to be an author? <laughs> oh, that's a tricky question. Uh -huh. So the, the, fundament, the fundamental thing I learned was to learn about the book business as a business and how uh, authors need to come into it with the idea of that they're responsible for many things. For example, when I first started out, I would go to Pittsburgh and I would be on morning drive time radio and then I would do the Good Morning Pittsburgh TV show and then I would do a lunchtime autographic and then I would do the Good Afternoon Pittsburgh TV show and then I would do drive time radio and then I would do an evening autographic and that you know and it would be this full media blast in that town except for drive time radio now all of that's gone so you have to come up with a whole new different approach to make yourself visible in some way so you have to hire a, your own publicist. The, the publisher just can't devote enough res resources to be able to get you to do on, onto things. So, and, and in, in history, it's very important to have now relationships with institutions such as C-SPAN. So my for this book, my biggest audiences were at the Pentagon and at Smithsonian and at uh, FDR Library and at uh, New York Historical Society. They weren't at bookstores and libraries as they were 20 years ago. So why did you switch? Why did you go into writing your own books? Because I needed to make a living. I had a mortgage. <laughs> but you had been employed by some of the biggest publishers ever. Uh, why did you leave that side of it and then go to writing? I had a big fight with my boss and decided to leave that company and found out I could not get another job quick enough to be um, uh, comfortable. What do people inside the book business fight about the most? Um, well, they fight every step of the way of publishing a book. <laughs> they fight about signing up the book. They fight about the cover of the book. They fight about the copy on the flap copy of the book. They fight about the the advertising and promotion of the book. So everything, it's, it's a struggle from the inside, too. What has been, first of all, how many books have you published and what's been your most successful book? Uh, this is my ninth book. I've sold over 350,000 copies of them all together. And my most successful was a book about going to the moon called Rocketman. It was on the New York Times bestseller list. Why do you think that was so popular? 
it came out for the 40th anniversary and it explained how the going to the moon was much more dangerous and dramatic than we had been led to believe by NASA. So it was a very fresh look. It also took, uh, the NASA History Department had conducted interviews, oral history interviews, with every, practically everyone who had ever worked there. So I was able to get janitor's impressions of what Buzz Aldrin was like and things like that. So it was a very, I think it was a very fresh original look at, at the NASA. Did you learn anything new in this book that you didn't know before you started? Well, this book started with a casual conversation a military analyst said to me, and he said, you know, on the battlefield, logistics eat strategy for lunch. And I thought, what have military historians been doing all this time? Because pretty much every military history book is the admirals said this and the general ordered that, you know. So so that was a little mind boggling. And then I started going into all this and, and came up with how fundamentally the issue that really made us victorious was uh, Roosevelt turning the country around politically and getting backing for doing this, and then the arsenal of democracy. So, so to me, it was a story that had never really been told before, a whole new way of looking at World War II. And it became a whole new way of looking at the Roosevelts, where I had always thought of Eleanor Roosevelt as being this kindly grandmother type. And in this book, she's like a political ninja. I mean, anytime someone goes after her, she just destroys them. And, and, and uh, you know, she didn't need Secret Service protection because she always had a gun in her bag. I mean, so <laughs> a very different view of these people. <laughs> What was your favorite thing about Roosevelt and what was your uh, the thing about him you didn't like? Um, the thing I did not like is that Roosevelt could not bear to fire people. So what he did instead was hire someone else to do your job and make you irrelevant and make you want to quit. Give us an example. <laughs> Over and over and over again. He did it to Knutson. He did it to Nelson. He did it to every, everybody we've discussed on this pretty much. He, he did that too. And, and, and it was a little bit ridiculous that he had to do that. Uh, but the, the fascinating thing to me about him was that everyone who worked for him realized that what they were dealing with was a persona. That he did this, a happy-go-lucky, regular guy next door, not all that bright, a uh, curious person who loves gossip and chatting. Uh, uh, it, and this was all an act. And everyone tried to look into Roosevelt and see the real guy, and they felt that they never could. So there's this very en enigmatic quality he has, probably as a result of being paralyzed, that he created this persona because he had to dramatically do something to offset his paralysis for a, do, for a life in politics. Should he have run, run that, in that fourth election knowing how he knew how sick he was? I think he didn't know how sick he was. I think really? he thought he might be immortal. Uh, uh, and, I, and, and, I, and I think that for all of his life, he thought that he truly believed that the best man to be president was him. I don't I don't think he had any self doubts. Uh, here, here's some statistics. I want you to deal with this. Uh, he died when he was 63, April 12, 1945. But in the four elections, 32, he had 472 electoral votes in 36, 523. His opponent, Landon, only had eight in 1940. He had 449 electoral votes. And in 1944, Tom Dewey, he beat 432 to 99. How could any one person be that popular for so long? Well, if you really look at this story, it's really easy to see. One thing he did that we don't have anymore is he would use programs to make American public feel elevated. People felt like in Lend-Lease that they were being good people in doing this. And he drew people together. He has the most. His speeches rival Churchill's for their eloquence and their and their prose. But he also had a tremendous ability to say, "We're all in this together, and we're working as hard as we can." And I'm counting on each and every one of you. And and he he reached out. He was a huge star of the radio at the time, which would be today like being a huge star of the internet. I mean, we don't 
really have a huge star of the internet beyond Trump now in politics. And, uh, uh, and he was able to get across his ideas in easy to understand analogies so that people really understood what was going on. There was an incredible situation for from between uh, 39 and 40 uh, before the fall of France when he and Lindbergh had it out on the radio. He would announce a new policy, Lindbergh would attack him, Roosevelt and his allies would point out other ideas, and the American public could follow along and listen to all this and make up their own minds. And it really was democracy in action, and it really worked. So you see him doing this over and over again, using proxies and, and polling and adjustments. He was never, after he was uh, sort of taken down by trying to pack the Supreme Court early in his presidential career, he was never ahead of public opinion. From then on, he never, he would let other people test out ideas, but he himself was never ahead of public opinion. He only did what he thought the majority of Americans wanted. When he was first elected in 1932, there were 23% unemployment. In 1936, 16.9% unemployment. In 1940, 14.6% unemployment. But in 1944, 1.9% unemployment. So did the war bail him out on the whole uh, depression? Well, what my entire uh, point as a historian in this book was is that we've traditionally been taught the Roosevelt era as being two different eras. The New Deal, which many people now teach as being not particularly successful, and the arts of democracy, which they teach as being the result of generals and admirals, that that's why that worked. And in this book, uh, really, you get to see that the New Deal and the arts of democracy was one thing, that the effort of taking on Hitler began in the 1930s with infrastructure. If we did not have things like the Hoover Dam, we wouldn't have had the electricity to make atomic bombs and make all these tanks and do all these things. So the fundamentals of that happened and also things like the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps run by Marshall when he was a captain uh, helped get people ready to do things like read blueprints, which would be a huge successful for winning the war. So really, if you take the seeds of the, uh, and basically all of the arts of democracy bureaucracy was the same that had been followed by the NRA, the National Recovery Act, which was an intersection between businessmen and Washington to fix the economy. The, the arts of democracy then threw in the military, but they were really a customer. They were really the people making all this happen at that time. So what you really see is one thing, and really Roosevelt is the man behind all of it, and so with between the, the New Deal and the arts of democracy, he both defeats Hitler and uh, ends the Great Depression. But what I really felt about this book is that it's the story of 11 years from 33 to 44, where the American people under his leadership rises from isolation and depression and despair and hopelessness to defeat the greatest evil in human history. And that's really sort of the story I was hoping to tell. Let me go back to some of the people you write about. One name I had never personally ever read about was Jesse Jones. Who was he? So I uh, grew up in Texas and the opera house in Houston is the Jones Opera House. Uh, so he's well known there because Jesse Jones started as a uh, timber man and he made millions selling timber. And then he ended up going into construction and all of these other things. And he was like a financial genius. Uh, he got dur during the uh, uh, during the uh, New Deal, he was able to get federal money to build the Houston shipyard, which completely changed that city's finances. But he then uh, came to Washington, first under Herbert Hoover, and then under FDR, and he oversaw uh, various operations that would lend money out to people and uh, that couldn't get lending money from anybody else, couldn't get loans from anybody else. So he created the Defense Plants Corporation at the start of uh, the Lend-Lease operation to give money so people could build new plants to create new, uh, and, and the government would hold on to the leases of these plants, but they would basically pay for the whole thing. Uh, and then they would get the property at the end of the war, or they would sell it back at very good prices. But Jones was so brilliant at this that he made money. He never lost any money, even during the middle of the Great Depression uh, with his operation. And he would do things like 
take over tin and take over, he created the greatest tin smeltering operation in the world. But my favorite story about him is that um, Roosevelt was obsessed with copper. He had taken over when he was assistant secretary of the Navy during the World War One. He had taken over copper production and basically took took over so much copper that Baruch, who is head of war plant production, had to get some of it back. So 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 he was obsessed with copper. So he tells various people at the at the the nascent operation he has going to for the war effort at that time. We need to get as much copper as we can. And they go to see Jesse Jones, and Jesse Jones hems and haws. He goes, okay, all right. But they're convinced that he's not really enthusiastic about this. So Jesse Jones says, well, we want you to go see my guy Clayton, who's a commodities trader. And Clayton seems blasé about all this, too. So the bureaucrats are getting really upset. And finally they go, Clayton, how much copper are you going to buy? And he says, the entire global supply. So (laughs) the level that Jones and Clayton and his men were used to dealing with, and they did it brilliantly. If you walk through Lafayette Park in front of the White House, there's next to one of the benches an obscure plaque that is in honor of Bernard Baruch. Doesn't say much, it just, I think the Boy Scouts were one of those that gave him this honor. Who was he and why did FDR rely on him for anything? So Bernard Baruch was the Warren Buffett of his time. He was considered the great sage of Wall Street, the guy who knew more about money than anybody else. But the greatest story about Baruch happens with Donald Nelson. So um, Donald Nelson starts hearing that he's about to be replaced and he's about to, that he's about to be replaced by Bernard Baruch because now he's disappointing Roosevelt. So he engineers a scheme where he announces he's firing Ferdinand Eberstadt. And Everset was a guy who came up with the idea that saved war production, where he controlled four distinct alloys and distributed them according to needs across the army, the navy, lend lease, all of these things. He was actually able to finesse the control of all manufacturing in the United States through these four unique uh, articles, chemicals. And um, so he announced he's quitting, he's firing Eberstadt because he knows that Nelson knows that FDR and Eberstadt had some kind of fight years ago and that FDR was still holding a grudge against Eberstadt. And no, no one else even remembers what this fight was about. So he fires Eberstadt. So now FDR realizes that if he indeed replaces Nelson with uh, 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 Baruch, it'll look like he doesn't endorse this firing of Eberstadt, which he doesn't want to do. And then he suddenly realizes if Baruch comes in, he's just going to run roughshod over everything and talk freely to the press, which he also doesn't want to do. So he holds matters to his chest uh, and Baruch shows up after he's been told he's getting this job and says, I'm here to report for duty. And, and Roosevelt as he often does, says, did I ever tell you about my meeting with Ibn Saud? And he goes on to this whole 20-minute story about Saudi Arabia. And he goes, well, I had to run by and takes off. And Baruch never gets the job. So to me, that's a, one of the great inside Washington stories of all time. Who was Hap Arnold? So the head of the Army Air Corps was a fantastic character named Henry Arnold, who was referred to as Hap, although he was not a smiling kind of guy. It was, it was I think, a joke, a joke nickname. Uh, in fact, when, if an underling didn't uh, do an order exactly as he wanted, he would say, obviously, you can't do this job, but I can, and you're fired. And he, he fired people quite frequently. Uh, he also... Uh, had an incredible moment in his life where he learned how to fly from a member of the Wright Brothers team in Ohio. And when you went to learn how to fly out of the cow pasture that they used as a runway, there was a man in a black car waiting by the side of the road because it was the undertaker, the local undertaker, would hang out by the Wright Brothers runway waiting for new business. Uh, uh, And then Hap Arnold developed a tremendous fear of flying. And for five years, he couldn't fly at all. And this was one of America's first airmail pilots, along with Lindbergh. Uh, And and he was incapable of flying, but he finally got over that. And he rose through the Army to become head of the Army Air Corps and then Army Air Forces. And he was very belligerent about getting his way with uh, what he needed out of Congress. And he played a little bit too much politicking. 
And on December 4th, the Chicago Tribune and the uh, uh, Washington Times Herald, who are both very anti-FDR people, announced FDR's war plans. And they published the secret uh, defense industry plans for what would happen if they had to fight a war with Germany and Japan. This was in and the this was in 40? No, December 4th, 1941. December 4th, three days before. Okay, go ahead. Three days before Pearl Harbor. So now we've forgotten this story because three days after Pearl Harbor, but uh, we believe the leaker to these uh, paper of these war plans was Hap Arnold. You talk about fear of flying. What impact did it have on our discussions with Churchill and, and Stalin that Stalin either was afraid of flying or wouldn't fly? <clears throat> so the relationship with Churchill and Stalin was com complicated, to say the least. The uh, uh, FDR, you know, we have this sort of general idea of, of Roosevelt and Churchill having this warm, fuzzy, friendly relation. Well, they did as long as it worked out for both of them. In many ways, they did not. Roosevelt was very hostile to uh, colonialism. He thought it was a great evil and one of the causes of the Great Depression. And Churchill wanted to restore the Victorian era of, of empire, the sun never setting, and uh, em emphasized this over and over again to one point where Marshall and he had a giant fight uh, uh, that uh, were taking over the island of Rhodes. And, and Marshall said, American blood is not going to be spent on those beaches. They, they just had it out. So the third party to all of this was Stalin, uh, who, uh, Church, who Roosevelt sent Harry Hopkins to visit to find out how staunch the Russians were really going to be in fighting Hitler. And Hopkins came back and said, they want, in part of Lend-Lease, they want aluminum, meaning they were in it for the long haul. And he was very taken with Stalin's analysis of the situation. Of course, the Soviets did this incredible thing with moving their entire capital over the Ural Mountains away from Moscow to keep it out of the hands of the Nazis. Uh, but uh, Churchill and Roosevelt then kept promising Stalin that they were going to open another front after the Nazis invaded Russia. They kept saying to Stalin, we're going to open another front. And uh, the generals at this time in America were convinced that they could do it as early as 42, which was really implausible. Uh, so instead they did North Africa, and instead they started coming up through Italy, and they kept telling Stalin that it's coming later. At the same time this was happening, the Nazi submarines were taking down the uh, American products that were going to Archangel to be lend lease for Russia. So they would say, we're sending you 20 ships and eight would show up. And Stalin thought he was being lied to. And it was finally, finally, they had sort of a knockdown drag out fight and uh, Roosevelt agreed to do May 1944, which was delayed to June 1944 and the invasion of Normandy. And finally, Stalin had some relief by the opening of the Second Front. Who is more evil, Stalin or Hitler? Well, I guess if you're Jewish, you say Hitler, and if you're Ukrainian, you say Stalin. Why? Because of the number of people, the millions who died under both of their regimes. I think I think the number one actually is considered Mao. I think more died under Mao than and Stalin's two and Hitler's three. But I, or I, I'm not sure where Pol Pot goes in there. It's hard, it's hard to assign a analog number when tens of millions are dying. What was your or what is your approach to writing a book? How do you do it? What you know? What's, what what about your research versus your writing? How much do you do on location? Where did you go, for instance, for this book to learn stuff that you didn't know? So um, I usually try to see what other books written for a general audience on the topic are, because I want to see where there's room for me in, in writing a history and, and what other people are saying. It's sort of like to get the lay of the land, sort of as an introduction. And then I start going after who has expertise in these various things. Like for this book, I went and I shot a rivet gun to see what Rosie the Riveter was up against. 
uh, 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 but I had to do a great deal of research for this book in the middle of COVID, and I myself got violently near death sick for a year and a half. So I had to do a lot of the research remotely, but I was able to work things out with FDR library to get a lot of the material sent to me or, or have access to them digitally, like like um, all of the correspondence between Eleanor Roosevelt and J. Edgar Hoover I went through, but ended up not in the book. There, there's so much material that I had to cut. This book was originally 1,100 pages long. So... <laughs> How, how so, much of your year and a half of illness was related to COVID? All of it. Yeah. I, I had what's now called long COVID. So how did you work through that and how miserable was it? I got a year and a half delay and the material I wrote while I was basically in comas uh, was very interesting because they had a lot of ideas, but there was no structure and the segues were just be all over the place. <laughs> Did you would did you eventually get rid of the long COVID? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Here's a. This is not. <clears throat> this is not that important. Although you might be feel differently about it. You write on page two forty four when you're talking about, you're quoting, um, the, the Butler Alonzo Fields, and we're talking about Churchill, and Churchill says to him, quote, when he's in the White House. I must have a tumbler of sherry in my room before breakfast, a couple of glasses of scotch and soda before lunch, and French champagne and 90-year-old brandy before I go to sleep at night. What was your reaction to that? Well, uh, he has a wooden leg, you know. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are people like that who are, are using uh, drugs or, get, or drinking at that level and still functioning just fine, at least until a certain time in the night. But anyway, uh, he was getting by with that level of drinking. And, and that wasn't that uncommon in the business. I was in the business when we had three martini lunches and then a nice afternoon nap. Another quote from your book, the hard truth is that nearly everyone outside the corridors of power completely failed to understand the depths of Hopkins's achievements with both the New Deal and World War II expand on that so as we know uh, president roosevelt was paralyzed and he couldn't get around the way a normal person could get around so he created a network of spies and the lead spy was eleanor who ran off all over the world gallivanting uh, it, it, roosevelt was frequently quoted as saying but proudly the missus really gets around uh but but sort of the secondary vice the sort of Second president, the second president of the United States, you might say, was Hopkins, because Hopkins not only oversaw lend lease and he oversaw a, a great deal of help during uh, the New Deal. He oversaw the WPA, uh, but he also was um, <clears throat> uh, Roosevelt's emissary and a very crucial emissary, first to go see what Churchill was really like and second to go see what Stalin was really like. And his report back that both of these leaders would be staunch and fighting were what really determined Roosevelt to be as staunch as he turned out to be in fighting this war. And uh, one of the sort of heartbreaking moments is that it, uh, when Hopkins goes to England and people find out he's there and they realize what has happened, they sort of lose their minds. And they, they, we even have follow-up reports from the FBI who say the country is wild about Harry. Uh, and, and there's an incredible moment where Churchill is betraying to Hopkins how um, alone he feels and how and how how bad things really are. And Hopkins says, I am here to tell you from the president that he is going to see you through. And it really is an incredible moment because it was really a moment when England was about to fail so much so that the Commonwealth governments of Australia and Canada tried to get the royal family to send their daughters, Elizabeth, of course, the queen we've known so long, and her sister, Margaret, who were, I think, 12 and 14 at the time, out to Canada or, or Australia for safeguarding because they thought everybody was going to die. And the mother responded by saying, the girls can't leave without me. I can't leave without the king, and the king will never leave. So they were going to go down with the ship. What was the impact on Harry Hopkins when his son was killed and how was he killed? 
Uh, he was 18 years old. He died in a Pacific battle. He was a private first class. And, and one of my favorite moments in this story is that uh, Churchill sends him this spectacular uh, sort of memorial, uh, uh, a hand-sewn piece of silk that has a, a great quote from Shakespeare about a young man dying in battle. We're at the end of our discussion, mostly, and I w just want to ask you, do you have another topic that you're already thinking about doing for your next book? I do not. I have been on tour for two months. This is my probably 150th hour of interview and lecture. <laughs> are, are you tired of it? <laughs> no, I really, I really love this book, and the response has been just tremendous. And I usually don't think that well of my books, but this one has gotten over very well. I get, I get a, uh, I get a, a piece of fan mail every every week. It's just fantastic. So, what, what do you sense people like the most about this particular book? I think that it reflects what we're going on right now, but it tells the story of people who start off much worse than we are and come out of it a okay. You know, it's it's sort of like it's sort of like the great happy heroic story of Americans in the 20th century. The name of the book is V is for Victory. Does that come from Churchill, by the way? Oh no, it comes from the uh, Belgian. Uh, 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 government in exile who's on the BBC broadcasting to other Belgians and they announced this idea of how in French and in Dutch and in, in English victoire is victory is all these related languages and they start spray painting V on Nazi stuff in the occupied territories and from then on it takes off of course it got turned into the peace sign the V sign for victory got turned into the peace sign in the 1960s and there were every so often where Churchill was in a hurry and he would show it backwards and his secretary to tell him you know that means up your bum you can't do that so <laughs> Craig Nelson is the author of this book and the subtitle, Franklin Roosevelt's American Revolution and the Triumph of World War II. Thank you, sir, very much. This is fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, and don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode. Questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.